night, oh, sorry. Last night, I met with some of the survivors and the loved ones of the victims of the horrific mass shooting at Robb Elementary School. I came here to tell them that the United States Department of Justice has finished its critical incident review. In undertaking this review at the request of the then mayor, the Justice Department committed to using our expertise and independence to assess the law enforcement response to the shooting and to provide guidance moving forward. As I told families and survivors last night, the department's review concluded that a series of major failures, failures in leadership, in tactics, in communications, in training, and in preparedness, were made by law enforcement lawyers and others responding to the mass shooting at Robb Elementary. As a result, 33 students and three of their teachers, many of whom have been shot, were trapped in a room with an active shooter for over an hour as law enforcement officials remained outside. I also told the families and survivors how deeply sorry I am for the losses they suffered that day and for the losses they have suffered every day since. I told them that the priority for the Justice Department in preparing this report has been to honor the memories of those who were taken from them. And I told the families gathered last night what I hope is clear among the hundreds of pages and thousands of details in this report. Their loved ones deserve better. The law enforcement response at Robb Elementary School on May 24, 2022, and in the hours and days after, was a failure that should not have happened. We hope to honor the victims and the survivors by working together to try to prevent anything like this from ever happening again, here or anywhere. I'm now going to turn to the key observations and recommendations of the report. On May 24, 2022 at 11.33 a.m., an active shooter wearing body armor and equipped with a high-power AR-15 rifle entered Robb Elementary School and began shooting into classrooms 111 and 112, which shared a connecting door. Within minutes, 11 law enforcement officers from the Uvalde Consolidated Independent School District and the Uvalde Police Department arrived inside the school. Hearing continued gunfire, five officers immediately advanced toward classrooms 111 and 112. Within seconds, shots were fired from inside the classroom. Shrapnel hit two officers, and all responders retreated to cover. A single officer then made additional attempts to approach the classrooms, but after 11.40 a.m., no more attempts to enter the rooms were made until 12.48 p.m., more than an hour later. As a consequence of failed leadership, training, and policies, Injured and scared students and teachers remain trapped with the subject in the classrooms waiting to be rescued. Survivors later shared that they heard officers gathered outside the classrooms while they waited. The victims trapped in classroom 111 and 112 were waiting to be rescued at 11.44 a.m., approximately 10 minutes after officers first arrived, when the subject fired another shot inside the classrooms. They were still waiting at 11.56 a.m. when an officer on the scene told law enforcement leaders that his wife, a teacher, was inside room 111 and 112 and had been shot. They were still waiting as broadcasts went out on officer radios that a student trapped inside rooms 111 and had called 911 at 12.10 p.m. to say that the officer was in, a, that the student was in a room full of victims. That student stayed on the phone with 911 for 16 minutes. The victims were still waiting to be rescued when the subject fired four more shots inside the classrooms at 12.21 p.m., 49 minutes after officers arrived on the scene. And they were still waiting for another 27 minutes after that until finally officers entered the classroom 
and kill the subject. As the victims were trapped and waiting for help, many of their families were waiting outside the school, growing increasingly concerned about why law enforcement had not taken action to rescue their loved ones. Law enforcement officers from different agencies who had self-deployed to the scene in overwhelming numbers were themselves waiting for leadership decisions about how to proceed. Many officers reported that they did not know who, if anyone, was in charge, what they should do, or the status of the incident. Some officers were confused about why there was no attempt to confront the active shooter and rescue the children. Some officers believed the subject had already been killed or that law enforcement was in the room with the shooter. Seventy-five minutes after the first officers arrived on scene, officers finally entered room 111. The subject engaged the entry, room, entry team with gunfire and the officers responded with fire. 77 minutes after the first officers arrived on the scene, and after 45 rounds had been fired by the active shooter, the shooter was killed. The massacre at Robb Elementary shattered families throughout this community and devastated our, our country. 19 children and two teachers were killed and untold numbers of students, teachers, and law enforcement officers were injured. The law enforcement response to the mass shooting at Robb Elementary was a failure. As the threat posed to our country by mass shootings has grown and evolved over the past several decades, law enforcement's response tactics have also changed. The massacre at Columbine High School 25 years ago and the 47 minutes it took for law enforcement to enter that high school marked a major shift in how law enforcement leaders think about responding to mass shootings. It is now widely understood by law enforcement agencies across the country that in active shooter incidents, time is not on the side of law enforcement. Every second counts. And the priority of law enforcement must be to immediately enter the room and stop the shooter with whatever weapons and tools officers have with them. That is the approach responding officers first employed when they arrived at Robb Elementary School. But within minutes of arriving inside the school, officials on scene transitioned from treating the scene as an active shooter situation to treating the shooter as a barricaded subject. This was the most significant failure. That failure meant that law enforcement officials prioritized a protracted evacuation of students and teachers in other classrooms instead of immediately rescuing the victims trapped with the active shooter. It meant that officials spent time trying to negotiate with the subject instead of entering the room and confronting him. It meant that officials asked for and waited for additional responders and equipment instead of following generally accepted active shooter practice and moving toward the shooters, shooter with the resources they had. It meant waiting for a set of keys to open the classroom door, which the report concludes was likely unlocked anyway. And it meant that the victims remained trapped with a shooter for more than an hour after the first officers arrived on scene. There were also other failures in leadership, command, and coordination. None of the law enforcement leaders at the scene established an incident command structure to provide timely direction, control, and coordination among the enormous number of responders who arrived on scene. This lack of a command structure exacerbated by communication difficulties contributed to confusion among responders about who was in charge and how they could help. These failures may also have been influenced by policy and training deficiencies at responding law enforcement agencies. Some lacked any active shooter training at all. Some had inappropriate training. 
Some lacked critical incident response training, and the vast majority had never trained together with different agencies. As Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta will discuss in further detail, the chaos and confusion that define the law enforcement response while the shooter remained a threat also defined the aftermath of the shooting. For example, surviving victims, some with bullet wounds and other injuries, were put on buses without being brought to the attention of medics. Some families were told that their family members had survived when they had not. And victims, families, and community members struggled to receive timely and accurate information about what had occurred at Robb Elementary. The Justice Department's objective in preparing this report was threefold. First, to honor the victims, the survivors, and their loved ones. Second, to provide a clear and independent accounting of the law enforcement response to the horrific attack that devastated this community. And third, to provide law enforcement agencies and communities across the country with analysis and recommendations about how what happened at Uvalde should inform efforts to prepare themselves for and respond to mass shootings. Policing is a noble profession. It is also a hard one. It requires training and constant education about evolving threats. The report includes widely accepted recommendations that have been adopted by law enforcement agencies across the country about how to prepare for and respond to active shooter situations. Before an active shooter incident occurs, law enforcement agencies have a responsibility to ensure that their leaders and all their officers are trained to focus on rapid response, trained that the first officers on the scene must focus on eliminating the threat and protecting the victims most in danger. Law enforcement officers responding to an active shooter must be prepared to take charge, to establish a unified command, and to facilitate communications, operational coordination, and allocation and delivery of resources. They must continually assess and adjust as the incident evolves. And in the aftermath of a mass shooting, law enforcement and government agencies must provide the public with a sense of trust and confidence by communicating openly, clearly, and compassionately during a time in which many are learning the most devastating news that any human being can receive. The victims and survivors of the mass shooting at Robb Elementary on May 24, 2022 deserve better. First and foremost, the 19 children and their two teachers who were stolen from their loved ones should be here today. They never have, should have been targeted by a mass shooter. We must never forget the shooter's heinous act that day. And the victims and survivors should never have been trapped with that shooter for more than an hour as they waited for their rescue. The families of the victims and survivors deserve more than incomplete, inaccurate, and conflicting communications about the status of their loved ones. This community deserved more than in misinformation from officials during and after the attack. Responding officers here in Uvalde, who also lo lost loved ones and who still bear the emotional scars of that day, deserve the kind of leadership and training that would have prepared them to do the work that was required. Our children deserve better than to grow up in a country where an 18-year-old has easy access to a weapon that belongs on the battlefield, not in a classroom. And communities across the country and the law enforcement officers who protect them deserve better than to be forced to respond to one horrific mass shooting after another. But that is the terrible reality that we face. 
And so it is a reality that every law enforcement agency in every community across the country must be prepared for. No community and no law enforcement agency should have to face that threat alone. That is why we came to Uvalde, and that is why we are releasing this report. The Justice Department remains committed to working in partnership with communities across the country and with the law enforcement agencies working to protect those communities every day. In particular, we stand ready to help communities and agencies prepare to respond to a terrible incident like the one that occurred here. We have concluded the department's review, but we know that the work of healing here in Uvalde is only beginning. We are humbled and grateful to stand with this community as you remember and honor your loved ones. I will now turn the podium over to Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta. Her leadership has been key to the department's efforts to conduct an independent, fair, and comprehensive review of the horrific mass shooting of May 24th and its aftermath. I am also grateful to the entire critical incident review team and the, to the department's COPS office under the leadership of Hugh Clements for their tireless work. Benita. All right, we're going to continue monitoring this. We've just heard from Attorney General Merrick Garland discussing the Justice Department's critical incident review of the 2022 elementary school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. 19 students, two teachers were killed. As Garland outlined, there were these failures, numerous, by, made by law enforcement officials. He said it was a failure that should not have happened, that the victims, quote, deserved better. The attorney general talked about his meeting with victims' families last night and apologized to them for the failed leadership in response to the shooting. I want to bring back in now former NYPD Detective Sergeant Felipe Rodriguez. He is also an adjunct professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Felipe, I asked you just before uh, the attorney general started speaking if someone else should have taken control. Someone should have. At that point, you know, we might have had someone that freezes. It does happen in law enforcement, or they just become overwhelmed, you know, with the incident. So someone, a senior officer, someone that has specialty training, some sort of specialized training, should have jumped in and became the incident commander at that point. Someone should have took charge. We saw when the Customs and Border Patrol officers showed up, they took charge, and the situation was handled. All right. Felipe Rodriguez, thank you so much for all of your insight into this. I'm going to bring back in now CBS News correspondent Lilia Luciano. She is in Uvalde, Texas. She has followed this incident from its very beginning. Lilia, it is such a haunting image that we heard from the attorney general of those victims trapped in there with the shooter, hearing law enforcement officials just outside of their door, but nobody coming in for more than an hour. We heard that Felipe believes that criminal charges should be brought. Um, I'm wondering, having had an opportunity to start reading through this substantial report, if you think that this starts to bring, uh, pave the way for those charges to be brought, and, and how the families that you have been in contact with throughout are responding now. Uh, this puts a spotlight on the district attorney here in Uvalde. Uh, the district attorney, she is the one that is that has in her hands the investigation by the Texas Rangers, which will likely have found the same thing that this report has found. She is the one that is to present evidence to a grand jury. She is the one that the families here in Uvalde have been constantly demanding uh, to, to, to ask for accountability from. Uh, the details here and of course, I'm not an expert in, in the policies um, as Felipe is, but the details here are so alarming. The failures here are things that we already knew about. Uh, the fact that the children had to wait for those 77 minutes. Uh, we have seen the videos. We have seen uh, what Mariano Pargas, what, uh, what Pete Arredondo did and didn't do. Uh, but this lays out from the perspective of law enforcement, the expectation that law enforcement agencies have given their training is all laid out in this report. And what is striking is those moments where uh, Chief Arredondo, uh, first of all, 
doesn't really take command, doesn't set up a command and control unit for so long. It is ultimately Vargas who does it on, according to the details here, on the request of somebody from the Texas Rangers. You have to set up command and control, and it is a long time after the shooting started. But the fact that we know, as uh, uh, Mary Garland just laid out, that it's not just that the first officers that went into that hallway and retracted after the gunshots were fired were supposed to just push through, but that everybody after that was supposed to push through. Uh, but Peter Redondo pushed people away. Uh, Pargas did not become the incident commander, even though, as this lays out, he was in a position to as well. He was the acting chief of the Uvalde Police Department. And those decisions that were made in that hallway misinformed every officer yeah. who was also trained outside. Uh, all of those details now are laid out here. The families have them in their hands. The public in the United States and the world now has this corroborating evidence of what we had seen piecemeal up until this moment will put a great deal of pressure on the attorney, on the uh, district attorney here in Uvalde to answer to put this in front of a grand jury as she said that she would last year now it's 2024 this happened in 2022 right. and perhaps that will lead to some accountability that is what the families have first and foremost and the other thing that i've heard from the families is what you heard from merrick garland the weapons the failures have everything to do with fear Fear lead, led clearly to failures, fear of this weapon. Uh, and that's something that the attorney general has uh, laid out very clearly. This is a weapon that was designed for the battlefield. An 18-year-old who had never owned a gun was able to just go, I have the place right in my line of sight, was able to go into that shot that I'm seeing about 100 yards away from where I'm standing, ask for an AR-15, all of that ammunition and go into that school after killing, I mean, after shooting, uh, not killing, sorry, his grandmother. Um, Lilia. That is the other theme that the families are saying yeah. is important to remind people of how easily he access that weapon. And we heard both of those themes, obviously, as you point out, from uh, the attorney general. But um, we he we're hearing from, uh, from our executive producer uh, that the president was asked about this question of criminal charges and his at first blush he said he doesn't think that there should be criminal charges i know that you and i have talked um, about the reporting that you've done there in uvalde and that there is a community that's deeply divided can you talk to us a little bit about that because sometimes i think when we report this it it, it feels like there's one narrative but you actually know more about all of the different nuances and some of the divisions even between police and the families of students that still exist there that's right one of the things that was um the most striking and heartbreaking coming here a year after last may a year after the shooting was to realize how fractured this community is along safety uh, political and 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 gun lines, uh, basically. There is there's a deep division here because this is the state of Texas, and uh, the families that are out there advocating for more gun control uh, stand in direct contrast to many people in their community. Also, in terms of accountability, as you heard right now from Mary Garland, and, and as this report lays out, look. This community every day has to step outside of their door and, God forbid, have an emergency at home and face the very officers that they have seen in those body cam videos not entering the room. There is only a handful of people who lost their jobs. And in the case of Mariano Vargas, he came back uh, to work in, in the city council or in the, in the, um, um, within the county. Um, so the people who were supposed to be in charge, the people who now were learning from the Department of Justice that not only were not in charge, but actually triggered a series of other failures that kept those children in that room with a shooter, went on to occupy positions of leadership in this community. It is a very small community. And so perhaps now that there is more detail in this document, we may see other types of consequences, whether they are not criminal, perhaps they are more... Um, uh, in terms of people losing their jobs, we'll see. Uh, but you're right, this community is deeply divided. But those who are out there advocating, they're not stopping anytime soon. And it is just so heartbreaking to read all these details of the failures. And I can only imagine for those poor parents 
who have to see all of that and relive all of that today. Lilia, thank you. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break now. Ahead, we're going to have the latest on the conflict in the Middle East. You're streaming CBS News. Well, let me start with this. This really happened. Have you told the government? Did any of that make sense? What's your response? You want me to just What's keep wrong going? with that argument? What have you learned? Do you know why? 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 It's time for 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS. An original documentary.